Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So we are from group number two from TLB8 presenting about the title Tadi Against Prosecutor. So about the brief of procedural history, the amended indictment was filed on 14 December 1985. The trial commenced on 7th of May 1996 and the trial chamber to rendered its opinion and judgment on 7 May 1997, finding Tadiq was guilty of violations of the laws of custom, of war and crimes against humanity. Thereafter, the trial chamber rendered its sentencing judgment on 14th of July 1997, sentencing Tadiq to 20 years of imprisonment. The parties appealed against the opinion and judgment of 7 May 1997, and Tadiq further filed an appeal against the sentencing judgment of 14 July 1997. Now we come to the brief of background of the facts of the case. After the takeover of Prizada, which is um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and the attack launched against the town of Kozarek, also in Bosnia, in 1982, the non-Serb civilians were detained in several prison facilities, in which where they were beaten, sexually assaulted, tortured, and also killed, and otherwise mistreated. Yusko Tadik was the president of the local board of the Serb Democratic Party in Kozarek, which is in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The trial chamber found that Dusko Tadik guilty of crimes against humanity and war crimes, and in a separated sentencing judgment, sentenced him to 20 years of imprisonment. The appeal chamber denied Dusko Tadik's appeal on all grounds. It did allow, however, the prosecution's appeal reversing the judgment of trial chamber and answering convictions of, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. The appeal chamber also held that an act carried out for the purely personal motives of the perpetrator can constitute a crime against humanity. Furthermore, trial chamber had erred in finding that all the crimes against humanity require discriminatory intent. The issue of sentencing was referred to a trial chamber. So we came to the decision made by the trial chamber. The trial chamber convicted Tadik of crime against humanity for prosecution and inhumane acts and violations under law or customs of war. In 1999, the appeals chamber denied Tadik's appeal on all grounds but allowed the prosecution's cross appeal and found that the trial chamber erred when it determined that the certain victims were not protected persons under the Geneva Convention relative to the protection of civilian persons in the time of war. That it could not be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of evidence before it that Tadik had any part in the killing of five men on the doctrine of common purpose and in finding that discriminatory intent required for all crime against humanity. The appeals chamber convicted Tadik on an additional nine counts for which he had been acquitted, consisting on grave breaches for inhuman treatment, willfully causing of serious injury, willfully killing, violation of the laws of custom of war for murder, and crimes against humanity for murder. The trial chamber sentenced Tadik to 20 years of imprisonment, which was amended by the appeals chamber, which sentenced Tadik to 25 years of imprisonment. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the case that will be presented today before this honorable court is the case of Dusko Tadik and against the prosecutor. Okay, before we start that, the prosecution and the defense may, may submit your written submission for the court. All right, the senior counsel on behalf of the appellant may start this and the court may proceed now. Your Honor, may I begin? Yes, you may. Much obliged. Your Honor, may I please this honorable court? My name is Muhammad Ferul Imran bin Khairul Anwar, appearing as the senior counsel on behalf of the defense. 
With respect to the first point, Your Honor, the defense believed that there was an inequality of arms leading denial of fair trial. In the first ground of the appeal against the judgment, the defense alleged that the appellant's right to a fair trial was prejudiced by the circumstances in which the trial was conducted. Specifically, it alleged that the lack of cooperation and the obstruction by certain external entities, which are the government of the Republic the government of the Republica Spesca and the civic authorities in Prejudice pre prevented it from properly presenting its case at trial. The, the defense contends that whilst most defense witnesses were Serbs still residing in the Republica Spesca, the majority of the witnesses appearing for the persecution were Muslims residing in countries in Western Europe and North America whose governments cooperated fully. It averts that the lack of cooperation displayed by the authorities in the Republica's first car had a disproportionate impact on the defense. It is accordingly submitted that there was no equality of arms between the prosecution and the defense at trial. And the effect of this lack of cooperation was serious enough to frustrate the appellant's right to a fair trial. The defense, therefore, requests the appeal chamber to set aside the trial chamber's findings of guilt and to order a retrial. Your Honor, the defense submit that citing cases decided by both the European Commission of Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights under the provision in the European Convention on Human Rights corresponding to the Article 20, Clause 1 of the Statute, the defense submit that the guarantee of a fair trial under the statute incorporates the principle of equality of arms. The defense accepts that the prosecution's submission that there is no case law which would support the inclusion of matters outside the control of the prosecution or the trial chamber within the ambit of the principle of equality of arms. However, however Your Honor, the defense argues that this principle ought to embrace not only the procedural equality or parity of both parties before the tribunal, but also substantive equality in the interest of ensuring a fair trial. It is accordingly submitted that the appeals chamber, when determining the scope of this principle, should be guided by the overriding right of the accused to a fair trial. The defense further claims that the principle of equality of arms embraces the minimum procedural guarantee set out in Article 21, Clause 4b, of the statute to have adequate time and facility for the preparation of the defense. It contends that the uncooperative stance of the authorities in the Republica's first car had the effect of denying the appellant adequate time and facility to prepare for trial to which he was entitled under the statute, resulting in the denial of a fair trial. As such, Your Honor, in support of its submissions, the defense cites paragraph of the judgment to show that the trial chamber was aware that both parties suffered from limited access to evidence in the territory of the former Yugoslavia. The defense acknowledged that the trial chamber, recognizing the difficulties faced by both parties in gaining access to evidence, exercised its powers under the statute and rules to elevate the difficulties through a variety of means. However, Your Honor, it contends that the trial chamber recognized that that uh, its assistance and uh, its assistance did not resolve these these difficulties, but merely elevated them. The defense uh, alleged that the inequality of arms persisted despite the assistance of the trial chamber and the exercise of the due diligence by trial counsel, as the latter were unable to to identify and trace relevant material defense witnesses and the potential witnesses that had been identified refused to testify out of fear. It submits that the lack of fault attributed to the trial chamber or the prosecution did not serve to correct inequality of in arms. And that uh, under these circumstances, Your Honor, a fair trial was impossible to reach. The defense contends that the appeals chamber should adopt the following two poll tests to, determ to determine whether on the fact a violation of the principle of equality of arms broadly construed has been established. 
With respect to the first branch of this test, the defense asserts that the first chamber, in its decision on admissibility of additional evidence, recognized that certain defense witnesses were intimidated into not appearing before the trial chamber. As we get to the second branch of the test, the defense contends that this, uh, this is a matter of weight and balance, while recognizing that not every inability to ensure the production of evidence would render a trial unfair. It summits that on the facts of, of the case, the volume and content of relevant and, and admissible evidence that could not be called at trial was such as to create an equality of arms that serve to frustrate a fair trial. Finally, Your Honor, the defense contends that the fact that trial counsel did not file a motion seeking a stay of trial proceedings should not be held to prevent the defense from raising the matter of denial of a fair trial on appeal. The defense counsel opined that, the, that trial counsel's decision not to seek an adjudgment of the proceedings could be attributed to wish not to prolong the extended period of the appellant's pre-trial detention. Your Honor, the defense admit that there was an inequality of arms leading denial of fair trial. Your Honor, having finished with the first issue, does this honorable court need any further clarification? No need. Much obliged, Your Honor. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing the argument, um, the appeals chamber finds that the appellant has failed to show that the protection offered by the principle of equality of arms was not extended to him by the trial chamber. His ground of appeals according to him. Your Honour, may I begin? Yes, you may. Much obliged. Um, Your Honour, may it please this honourable court. My name is Amalin Husna Muhammad Nazir, appearing as the junior counsel on behalf of the appellant. Having finished with the first ground submitted by my co-counsel, with respect to the second point, Your Honour, the defence believed that there was an error of facts leading to a miscarriage of justice at the trial chamber. The trial chamber made the factual finding that the appellant was guilty of the murder of two Muslim a policeman, which is in the embassy, and a man uh, identified at trial by the name of Osman, based on the, te the testimony of only one witness, which is Nihat Seferovi. The defense contend that the trial chamber erred in deciding that it was satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that he was guilty of the two murders because the chamber relied on the uncorroborated uh, evidence of Mr. Seferovi. The defense maintains that Mr. Safarovi is an unreliable witness because he was introduced to the prosecution by the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina, a source which uh, the defense alleged that the trial chamber found to be tainted for having uh, planted another prosecution witness, Dragon Opasi. The letter was found to be untruthful at trial and consequently withdrawn with uh, prosecution. Your Honour, the defence argues that the trial chamber erred in uh, relying on evidence of Mr. Seferovi because it is implausible. Mr. Seferovi, a Muslim who lived in an area under bombardment by Serbian paramilitary forces, fled to the mountains for, for safety. He testified at trial that he was so concerned about the welfare of his pet pigeons that he returned to town to feed them while the Serbian paramilitaries were still there. On his return to town, he saw Mr. Tadik kill two policemen. Uh, the defense counsel contended at trial that the witness was never in town at the time of the killings. The defense maintains that the appeal chamber, uh, in reviewing the factual findings of the trial chamber, is entitled to consider all relevant evidence and can reverse the chamber's finding if it is satisfied that no reasonable person could conclude that the evidence of Mr. Seferovi proved that the appellant was responsible for the killings. As such, Your Honour, the defence asked the appeal chamber to reverse the trial chamber's finding that the appellant is guilty of the murders of Adik Besi and the man identified by the name of Osman. If there is no further assistance favour by the chamber, I shall pass to the learned counsel.
in uni. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing the defense by the appellant, okay, the appellant has failed to show that he had several ways reliability as a witness is suspect or that his testimony was inherently possible. Since the appellant did not establish that the trial chamber heard in relying on the evidence of Mr. Seferovic for its factual finding that the appellant killed the two men, the appellant chamber sees no reason to obtain the finding. Your Honor, may I begin? Yes, you may. Blush or blush. Your Honor, may it please this Honorable Chamber, my name is Munib, Muhammad Munib Usairi, appearing as the Senior Counsel on behalf of Respondent. Appearing together with me today is my then co counsel Muhammad Lukman Hilmi bin Muhammad Fawad. Your Honor, the prosecutor wish to put forward four issues. I will be dealing with the first and second, second issue, and the remaining submission will be deal with my co counsel for uh, third and fourth issue. Your Honor, there are four issues to be submitted before this honorable court. Firstly, the trial chambers finding that it had not been proved that the victims were protected persons under Article 2 of the statute. Second, the finding of insufficient evidence of participation in the killings in Jaski. Third, there is, there is a crime against humanity where the accused acted out of purely personal motive. And for the last issue, the decision to reject our motion to release defense witness statements. Your Honor, for the first issue, there are no proof that the victims were protected persons under Article 2 of the statute. On the first ground, prosecutors submit that the appellant was acquitted on these counts on the ground that the victims referred to in those counts had not been proved to be protected persons under the applicable provision of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Your Honor, firstly, the prosecutor maintains that all relevant criteria under Article 2 of the statute were met. Consequently, the trial chamber earth by relying exclusive, exclusively upon the effective control test derived from the case concerning military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua in order to determine the applicability of the grave bridge provisions of the relevant Geneva Convention. We submit that the chamber should have instead applied the provision of the Geneva Convention and the relevant principles and authorities of the international humanitarian law, which in its view apply a demonstrable link test. In distinguish the present situation from the facts in Nicaragua, we note that Nicaragua was concerned with state responsibility rather than individual criminal responsibility. Further, we assert that the International Court of Justice in Nicaragua deliberately avoided dealing with the question of which body of treaty rules was applicable. Instead, the court focused on the minimum yardstick of rules contained in Common Article 3 of the Geneva Convention, which in the court view apply to all conflicts in Nicaragua, thus obviating the need for the court to decide which body of law was applicable in the case. Furthermore, the the prosecutor submitted that the trial chamber uh, by not applying the provisions of the Geneva Conventions and general principle of the international humanitarian law to determine individual criminal responsible for grave breaches of the Geneva Convention. In the prosecution submission, these sources require that there are be a demonstrable link between the perpetrator and a party to an international arm, conflict of which the victim is not a national. Your Honor, for the second ground on this issue is the requirement for the applicability of the Article 2 of the statute. Article 2 of the statute embraces various disparate classes of offences with their own specific legal ingredients. The general legal ingredients, however, may be categorised as follow. First, the nature of the conflict. 
according to the interpretation given by the appeals chamber in its decision on a defense motion for interlocutory appeal on jurisdiction in the prison case, the international nature of the conflict is a prerequisite for the applicability of Article 2. Second, the status of the victim. Grave breaches must be perpetrated, perpetrated against person or property defined as protected by any of the four Geneva Convention of 1949 to establish whether a person is protected. The reference must be clearly be made to relevant provision of those convention. As a result, the appeal chamber in the current case must first determine under what illegal circumstances armed forces engage in an apparent domestic armed conflict may be acting on behalf of foreign power, and whether in the present case the armed forces are acting on behalf of foreign power, the required factual criteria for the statute were met. The appeal chamber can only evaluate the second point, whether the victim should be considered protected individuals if the dispute was international at all relevant time. Having finished with the first issue, does this honorable chamber need any further clarification before I continue to submit on the next issue? No need. Much obliged. If there is no further assistance favored by this honorable chamber, that should conclude my submission on the first issue. Okay. Uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing the issues from the on behalf of the after hearing the issues, uh, it follows from the above that the trial chamber heard in so far as it acquitted the appellant on the sole ground that the grave breaches regime of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 did not apply. The appeals chamber accordingly finds that the appellant was guilty of grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions on counts 8, 9, 12, 15, 21, and 30. May I continue for the second issue? Okay. For the second issue, the finding of insufficient evidence of party participation in the killings in Jaski. Your Honor, the prosecutor fully accept the findings of the fact of the tri chambers that Article 4 will still be applicable, but we will argue on two grounds for this issue. For the first ground of this issue, on the basis of the state facts, the trial chamber has misdirected itself on the application of the law on the standard of proof. Yes, you mean. Reasonable doubt. In relation to the first error, the prosecutor submit that the only reasonable conclusion to be drawn from the facts found by the trial chambers is that of guilt. The test of uh, the test for proof beyond reasonable doubt is that the proof must be such as to exclude not every hypothesis or possibility of innocence, but every fair of rational hypothesis which may be derived from the evidence, except that of God. The trial chambers hypothesis that there was there were was a distant possibility that the killing of the five victims may have been the act of a quiet distance group of a man is not fair or rational. The use of such term as bare possibility and could suggest indicates the misapplication of the test of proof beyond reasonable doubt. Your Honor, for the second ground of this argument, of this issue, the prosecutor said that the trial earth in its use of the common purpose theory when deciding that we had not met its burden of proof. As to second error, the prosecutor submit that the gist of the common purpose doctrine is that if a person knowing, knowingly, knowingly participates in a criminal activity with others, he or she will be liable for all illegal acts that are natural and probable consequences of that common purpose. The trial chamber found that the appellant's participation in the attack on civic and justice 
was part of the the armed conflict in the territory of Frigida Man municipality between May and December 1992. A central aspect of the attack was a policy to rid the region of the non serb population by committing inhuman and violent acts against them in order to achieve the creation of a greater Serbia. According to the prosecution, the only conclusion reasonably open from all the evidence is that the killing of the five victims was entirely predictable as part of the natural and probable consequences of the attack on the village of Sivic and Jaski on 14 June 1992. It is the prosecution submission that this policy of ethnic cleansing was carried out throughout obstinate procedure against not serbs by various illegal means, including killings. In this regard, the appellant actions and presence directly, directly and substantially assist that policy. It follows that regardless of which member or members of the serb forces actually kill the five victims, the appellant should have been found guilty under Article 7, Clause 1 of the statute. Having finished with the second issue, does this honorable chamber need any further clarification before my co counsel continue to submit on the next issue? Uh, no need. If there is no further assistance favor by this honorable chamber, that shall conclude my submission on the second issue. Thank you for your time and indulgence. Your Honor, may I begin? Yes, you may. Much obliged. May it please this Honorable Court, my name is Muhammad Mahimi bin Muhammad Fred, appearing as the junior counsel on behalf of the respondent. Your Honor, I will continue the third and fourth argument in respect to continue the argument stated by my senior counsel, Muhammad Munib bin Yusheri. Your Honor, the third argument is there is a crime against humanity where the accused act of, out of purely personal motive. For the first ground, the prosecutor would like to argue that Article 5 of the statute does not contain a requirement that crimes against humanity cannot be committed for purely personal reason. Therefore, it cannot be inferred from the requirement that the crime must have a connection to the armed conflict that there is any such requirement. Additionally, the prosecutor like to keep arguing that the armed conflict requirement is not a substantive element of the mens rea uh, of the crime against humanity, but it is a jurisdic jurisdictional one which is not a legal ingredient of the subjective element of the crime. Your Honor, the prosecutor admits that this finding did not play any role in arriving at the verdict that they intend to appeal, but on the other hand, we, the prosecutor argued that the finding in question raised a significant legal issue on that is of general significance to the jurisprudence of the tribunal. For this reason, the prosecutor also want to deny that the weight of authority supports the proposition that crimes against humanity can be committed for purely personal reason and that the sole authority relied on the trial chamber. In support of its finding, it suggest, suggests that even where perpetrators may have been personally motive to commit the acts in the question, their conduct can still be characterized as a crime against humanity. Subsequent decision of the United States Military Tribunal under the Control Council Law No. 10 and of Nation Courts are also consistent with the view of that the perpetrator of crime against humanity may act out of purely personal motive. Plus, a narrow interpretation of the category of offences failing within the scope of Article 5 would run the counter to object the purpose of the tribunal statute in providing a broad scope for humanitarian law. Your Honor, in addition, many people who commit crimes against humanity can avoid being held accountable by the International Tribunal 
by simply claiming that they were motivated by their own selfish interests. Having finished with the third issue, does this honorable chamber need any further clarification before I continue to submit on the next issue? No need. Much obliged. If there is no further assistance favor by this honorable chamber, that should conclude my submission on the third issue. Your Honor, the last argument is the decision to reject the prosecution motion to release defense witness statement. For the first ground in the prosecution perspective, the trial chamber have made an error in my in the application of substantive law in its witness statement decision. The prosecutor would like to argue that a trial chamber possesses the authority in accordance with the Rule 54 to order the production of prior statement or defense witnesses, unless those witnesses are shielded from disclosure by an express or implied privilege in either the statute or the rules. This authority guarantees that a trial chamber, which is tasked with the responsibility of making factual finding based on the evidence presented, is, is a trial chamber ought to be afforded the opportunity to take into, the, into account and weigh any inconsistencies between the statement made by witnesses. We also submit that the rules that do not create an implied privilege for taking the confidentiality confidentially of defense witnesses statement as the judge Stephen found with the judge warrant concurring. Judge Stephen's citation of the legal professional privilege found in national jurisdiction is incorrect. The prosecution argued that because the rules are clear on the matter, despite the obvious impact of the adversarial system on the rules, we contend that even if any ambiguity exists, it should not be resolved by looking to what is typically done in such jurisdiction. Rule 89B of the rules mandate that rules of evidence which will be will best favor of a fair determination of the matter before it and a consonant with the spirit of the statute and the general principle of law must be used. Your Honor, the trial chamber should have favored an interpretation allowing, the, allowing it to add to order disclosure of the defense witnesses statement where it considers that this will enable it to reach a verdict based on all pertinent evidence in accordance with the provision. Particularly, the prosecution rely on the limitation imposed by United States Supreme Court in United States against the nobles. Finally, the prosecution will, the prosecutor would like to assert that releasing the defense witnesses Retired statement doesn't go against basic notion of justice. To be more specific, the principle of equality of arm does not mandate the defense to be given preferential treatment when calling witnesses. A defense witness should, in theory, be subject to the same scrutiny as the prosecution witness at the trial, regardless who of who called them. Having finished with the last issue. Does this honorable chamber need any further clarification before I end the prosecutor submission? No need. Much obliged. If there is no further clarification, that should conclude our argument of the all issue. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, after hearing the argument, um, in light of the appeals chambers, finding that Article 2 of the statute is applicable. The appellant is found guilty on Count 29, brief breach in terms of Article 2 Clause A, willful killing of the statute, and Article 7 Clause 1 of the statute. And next, the trial chamber's finding on Count 30 is set aside. The appellant is found guilty on Count 30, which is violation of the laws or custom of war in terms of Article, Article 3 Clause 1, Parallel A, murder of the statute, and Article 7 Clause 1 of the statute. And lastly, the trial chamber's finding on the count 31 is set aside. The appellant is found guilty on count 31, uh, which is crime against humanity in terms of Article 5 plus 8 of the statute and Article 7 plus 1 of the statute.
All right, to conclude, we could say that on the 14th January 2000, the appeals chamber heard that the oral judgments, oral arguments on the defense appeals against the sentencing judgment handed down by trial chamber on 14th of July 1997, and that handed down by the trial chamber on 11th November of 1999. On 26th January 2000, the appeals chamber sentenced Dusko Tedek to a maximum of 20 years imprisonment. So I think that's from our group regarding on this case of Tedding and Public Prosecutor. That's all from us. Thank you.